we are dealing with some of the greatest challenges humanity's ever faced, you know, in terms of displacement, in terms of climate change. Um, And these are complex and difficult things and they're not going to be easily solved. So it kind of requires a bit of heavy lifting to get in Mm -hmm. and to kind of really understand these things. And not everyone's going to agree with my point of view, not everyone's going to agree with yours. And that's fine because we live in a democracy, but we do need to learn how to disagree again. And I think a way to do that is to expose yourself to other arguments, read widely and be and and read critically with a view of, well, who is telling me this and why are they telling me this and what's the position they're coming from? And once you start doing that, it becomes quite clear the, the kind of rationale behind information being put out so that um, you can understand um, you can see pretty clearly what's misinformation and what's designed to, to, to manipulate. Um, but it, it does require a bit of work. Today's guest on the podcast is the Pacific editor for The Guardian, Ben Doherty. Now, I met Ben back in 2015. I had returned with my family for a brief trip back from Iraq where we were living at the time and He was so intrigued uh, by what we were doing over there in the face of the ISIS crisis, caring for families um, that had fled, that he actually wrote an article, and I remember sitting in his home in Bondi with his family around, and uh, as we shared and and talked, and and I really felt such a connection actually with Ben and and was really just excited to be able to now be able to turn the tables on him and get him on the podcast and hear his story and what has influenced his life. He's someone that has spent his career two decades now um, sharing about issues of human rights and injustice around the world. Uh, As a result, he was awarded three Walkley Awards, uh, one of the highest honours in journalism in Australia, as well as three United Nations Media Peace Awards. Again, an incredible honour for anyone working in this craft in the area of journalism here in Australia. And uh, as we talk and discuss many issues surrounding uh, human rights issues and, and just in general, the whole idea of using journalism, using your voice to shed a light on injustice and hopefully bring freedom, I know that you're going to be inspired to use whatever you've got in your hands Um, Without further ado, here's my discussion with Ben Doherty. Journalism, and I I don't want to be too sort of strong about it, um, uh, but there is a a kind of vocational element uh, to journalism. Like, you know, telling stories is a very fundamental human condition um the way we relate to others the way we understand it you know a complex and capricious world is to kind of put narratives around things and, and to mm. give things a story arc and and to give things an understanding and and journalism states that to a degree you know why is this happening why is there this conflict why mm-hmm. why is this happening in this place um and journalism seeks to answer those questions so there's something kind of very um sort of atavistic and 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 fundamental about journalism i'd always grown up in news in in a house in a house that uh, my parents read newspapers, um, both from Australia and overseas. Um, we watched, you know, the ABC News religiously at seven o'clock every night. Um, mm-hmm. And this is the days before, you know, iPads or computers, so I couldn't go off and watch my own thing on Netflix. That sure. didn't exist, so it was ABC News every night. So I, I grew up with a sense of the, I suppose, um, and again, I, I, I don't want to lean on this too heavily, but that that sort of fourth estate role of journalism and the importance of of media and journalism and and the role of journalism in a in a democratic society and um, holding uh, holding governments to account in in you know in in revealing matters of, of public interest, I suppose. Mm-hmm. So I, I had perhaps maybe an, an idealistic you know idea about around what journalism was, um, but it always interested me because it, it seemed to me that journalism gave you a kind of front row seat to sort of mm-hmm. um, absolutely extraordinary uh, happenings. You know, you got to see fascinating people doing extraordinary and and deeply powerful and important things and and you got a front row seat and you got to ask questions about it and to write about it you know i was just reflecting this week um with this um the uh this dreadful coup in in myanmar Mm. um that i was in myanmar in 2010 when uh, aung san Suu Kyi was released from house arrest i remember I, i remember standing at the barricades um uh, when the military dropped the barricades and running the 400 metres or so, with you know, surrounded by uh, Myanmar's people screaming, Dorsu, Dorsu, running to her front gate, being at the front gate and being very aware at the time, you know, all the while trying to write notes and, and, and write my copy for the, for the next day's paper, but being supremely conscious that 
you know, this was history being made. Um, and, you know, you kind of had a, had a, had a front row seat to it and we can, you know, re- reflect on, on, on Dorsu's mm. behavior and, and, and action since, since but, but, yeah. I, but uh, yeah, but I, I, I suppose, um, that sense of of helping to write in very rough terms, you know that that first draft of history, as they as, as they kind of call journalism, felt to me to be a hugely, um, you know, intoxicating thing to do, like a right. like a fascinating, you know, a, a fascinating profession. So I kind of fell into journalism, you know, completely by accident. I I saw there was a cadetship, not by accident, quite deliberately, but in a kind of slightly. Um, backdoor manner in that I saw there was a, a, uh, a cadetship advertiser, the Bendigo advertiser, and I got in my car from Melbourne and drove up to Bendigo and knocked on the editor's door and said, I'm your new cadet. Um, uh. And he kind of said, he, he said, that's very funny. You can put your, you know, your CV on the pile. And I said, look, I'm going to be in town for a week. Wow. Um, uh, I'm going to, can I bring you some stories? And I brought him stories for a week. And at the end of the week, he gave me the job. And so, uh, you know, from there, I, I, I went from Bendigo to Canberra to Melbourne and then overseas um, and so you just kind of keep looking for the next story, I suppose, and, and it sort of unfolded from there. Mate, um, you know, as you kind of just sharing, you know, your journey into journalism, what draw you into almost that idealistic, you know, front row seat, mm. telling the truth, holding people to account, um, being part of change in society, you know, mm. writing the narratives, telling the stories that need to be told. It seems, though, however, there's like at least from my perspective, with the rise of misinformation, uh, journalism mm. seems to be in a crisis to a certain degree. And um, how does that make someone like you feel who's like dedicated their life to it? What are some of the, what would you tell listeners, you know, in this moment um, is so, um, is, is the most important thing, especially within the world of, of German, journalism? I don't think it's too strong to say that journalism journalism is in crisis, and it's in crisis on in crisis on a number of fronts. Um, uh, certainly on the sort of business level, which which lots of people talk about about how how the industry kind of survives and mm-hmm. and and is viable, but even on a more existential level existential level about what its purpose is um, and and the way journalism is performed, because we have seen this democratization of information sources, and that in lots of ways is a great thing. Sure. That, 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 that everybody now is allowed to be part of the public debate. You know, the, the kind of idea of the ancient Greek idea of the four, you know, the, the town square where where mm. ideas can be debated um, and, and that, 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 that really old-fashioned kind of sense of a, of a contest of ideas is now open to everyone. It's not just open to mm-hmm. newspaper barons or, or people who own TV stations. So in lots of ways, that democratisation of information is, is, a, is, is a great and powerful thing. But you can also see how powerful it is when it is deliberately misused for mm-hmm. misinformation to to you know promote hate speech to yes. um to promote dangerous medical messages we, you know we, which is what what we're seeing in in the world now but you know but used by people to manipulate others right. um uh and you know to to incite a, you know uh insurrection even yeah. um so so it is it is i mean and again you know we meant when when we were talking um before we started the recording tim or yeah. about you know we've with great power comes great responsibility. There is mm-hmm. power in words. There is power in information, and yeah. it does need to be used. Um, uh, it does need to be used carefully, and it does need to be used with a, with with an understanding of 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 its power. And this is not to say that journalism should be strictly regulated, and you know, a government or some sort of authority should be able to say you're a journalist, you're not a journalist, you're a journalist, you're not. Um, but the but I think. Um, I think there is a responsibility on those of us who do practice journalism and call ourselves journalists to do it in a responsible fashion. And people might not agree with everything I write or everything that The Guardian says. Um, but the idea is that information is presented um, in good faith um, and with rigour and with an idea of informing the public, um, uh, with an idea of contributing in a, in a meaningful way to that to that contest of ideas. I think people putting information into the world does it deliberately time to mislead people or incite violence or incite hatred is hugely damaging and and needs to be called out and and needs to be condemned when whenever it's seen and needs to be kind of squashed um, you know as as hard as possible and 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 countered very very quickly. Now it's very easy for me and you to see sure. it, see here and, and, and say that and say, oh, we need to stop this information. But you know, the old Churchill quote about the lie being halfway around the world by the time the truth is got its boots on, sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like it is, it's a really difficult thing to do. And I think what that then leads us to is, well, what do you know? And I don't love the word consumers, but 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 people who are reading news and, and right. reading news online and, and and those sort of things. 
what can they do to sort of, you know, um, I suppose to to uh, prevent the spread of misinformation um, and to prevent themselves being misled by this. And and my, my answer to that is to read widely and to read critically, um, to read lots of news sources, right to read uh, to read news sources that you don't think you're going to agree with. You know, get outside your bubble, um, read opposing ideas and debates, and be prepared to kind of sort of do the hard work in your own mind to, 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 to work through these things. We are dealing as, as, as a global community and as national societies and as smaller communities, we are dealing with some of the greatest challenges humanity's ever faced, you know, in yes. terms of displacement, in terms of climate change. Um, and these are complex and difficult things and they're not going to be easily solved. So it kind of requires a bit of heavy lifting to get in mm -hmm. and to kind of really understand these things. And not everyone's going to agree with my point of view, not everyone's going to agree with yours. And that's fine because we live in a democracy, but we do need to learn how to disagree again. And I think a way to do that is to expose yourself to other arguments, read widely and be and and read critically with a view of well, who is telling me this and why are they telling me this and what's the position they're coming from. And once you start doing that, it becomes quite clear the the kind of rationale behind information being put out so that um, you can understand um, you can see pretty clearly what's misinformation and what's designed to to, to manipulate. Um, but it, it does require a bit of work. I mean, and and yeah. and maybe that's part of the kind of you know democratic obligation that you have to be an informed and 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 contributing member of your society. You know, to 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 be that that in, informed citizen is to is to kind of um, you you are obliged to kind of um, uh, do your due diligence, I yeah. suppose, on, on these issues that that the that the world is wrestling with. Yeah, you know, I think that that element of of curiosity we were talking about earlier of there's a there's so many ways to look at an object you could look at it from the side you could look at it like this mm -hmm. and as you as you do expose yourself ag again to being uh, well read being critical analyzing and, and that it, critical in the sense of being curious you know don't just take something uh, mm. at at face value um, yeah wrestle with it and i mean it's just brought such in it's enrichment um in in growth in my own life as i've i've allowed my own echo chambers to be blown apart right and what mm. i think that's the scary thing is we see so many echo chambers growing and developing and and the mm. danger can be to go from one echo chamber to another echo chamber too as well so you you change mm. your views but then you just become so engrossed and absorbed in in where you've got to there it's that ability to foster and to hold um, the tension of yeah. of quite a yeah, very, that, quite, that sort of quite cognitive of dissonance of, of differing worldviews and, and 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 differing yeah and and you're right and and the kind of solidifying walls around those echo chambers are getting harder and harder they're to, getting harder uh, to harder. get out of and and um and 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 this kind of you know and if if you exist in one and don't know anything about the other you know they inexorably sort of drift apart um, and then all of a sudden when you're trying to debate something. Um, it becomes really difficult, and people have always had, you know, uh, you know, political disagreements. But but in 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 past generations, it feels to me as though we've been working from a kind of fund, uh, you know, a foundational base of understanding of what reality is. But because we're getting so deep into these echo chambers, our realities are becoming different. Oh, you know, yeah, our exactly. worldviews are becoming so difficult that we uh, so different rather that we find it very difficult to kind of recognise. Uh, 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 the other, we we find it very difficult to accept another's worldview and 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 to to sort of recognise another's humanity, and that that mm -hmm. leads us that, that leads us, I think, down a down a very difficult path. And so, you know, to to get to your broader theme of of justice, and I've been sort of yeah. rolling it around in my head the 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 the, the last few days. Mm -hmm. And one of the words that that I that that sort of came and, and people talk about. Uh, justice in in terms of you know and they think of it in terms of equality and in terms mm -hmm. of fairness and all those sorts of things are, are absolutely correct but the other word that that, that came into my mind was imagination um and mm. it struck me as a sort of slightly odd thought and um yeah. and i sort of interrogated a, a little bit more but but justice as an act of imagination i think really interests me having the sort of the imagination and the courage as well to sort of consider another person's perspective to see what the world looks like from their point of view to be able to imagine mm -hmm. yourself from from somebody else's perspective i think is a really powerful tool mm -hmm. and that's a, that's a really interesting way to finding a just just solution i have an idea about something you have a contradictory view about it i can't see 
why, how you would arrive at your position until sure. I have the imagination to put myself in your, in your shoes, shoes and from your perspective oh and to be able to, to be able to see the world from your point of view. So I think in terms of finding justice, in, 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 in terms of finding, you know, a just and equitable and fair solution for some of the world's great problems, we need to be able to imagine ourselves in another's place. And that's somebody else in my community who I might not, not agree with. That's somebody else in another country. That's somebody else from, a, from, from, from another culture. Someone whose who's background is completely different to mine. I need to have the imagination to be able to, to see their world as well as understand mine. That reminds me of a quote by Brene Brown who says, it's easy to, it's, it's, it, it's hard to hate people. It's hard to hate people up close. Mm. And it's this yeah. idea of when you listen to someone's story, their experience, like you said, you put yourself in someone's shoes, you imagine yourself in their story. There's, yeah. It's very difficult to be indifferent. It's very difficult to not care. It's very difficult to not see um, things in for, for your own opinions, thoughts, mm. worldview to, to, to not be challenged and changed. And um, that is the beauty, I think, that I love um, in journalism. Uh, it's going into some of the most difficult, horrendous stories. I watched a Four Corners documentary on the, the Uyghurs in, mm. I think, in Xinjiang. Yeah. And I don't know if I pronounced that right. But it was, um, again, just as I've kind of lived amongst the Yazidi genocide that took place, it took me back to this is happening again. And this has been happening mm. and is happening elsewhere, we don't know. Mm. And um, listening to the stories, listening to the personal accounts and struggles of, of some of these, those that have been able to escape, it compels me to this. I cannot not do anything. I, can, I can't not unknow mm. this anymore. I can't yeah. not... I can choose to ignore it and move on, but it's left. I think that was one of my heroes, William Wilberforce. Is it, you yeah. know talks about this. You, you cannot not do something about it once you've yeah. You've seen once it once you know, and 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 there is a real watershed moment of once you've been exposed to this, like you say, you can't unknow those things. No. Um, and 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 you are compelled to to do things i i i i thought that that earlier quote um from brown was a really interesting one mm. it's hard to hate people up close and most and i think that that can be one of journalism's most um most powerful attributes is to be able to tell those personal stories to be exactly. able to reduce kind of not not reduce but but explain um you know broad difficult issues in the singular in the personal can be mm. incredibly powerful and it is possible then to understand another person's story if you've heard their personal account their personal situation and and you can you can relate to that it's very hard to relate to a sort of large amorphous mob of people um you know mm -hmm. uh, but 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 or you can relate to one statistics, person. Yeah. you know exactly yeah exactly you know so, so statistics sort of wash over us like a wave and, and don't mean anything but that yeah. one person's story that one family story that one child story can can sit and, and resonate with us and i think that's one of the, the dangerous things we've seen in this country and in others around issues like uh, 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 of asylum seekers and, and refugees this this idea yeah. that um the language is dehumanizing mm -hmm. and distancing and it, it reduces people to this sort of amorphous unknowable and potentially threatening mob so Q we jump <laughs> yeah and 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 we we hear about waves of migrants um mm. and uh, or, or or you know and um uh, and, and we talk about floods of illegals and, the, and and this sort of hugely pejorative language mm. whereas these are all individual people and and yes. um once you get to know those individual stories those barriers break down very quickly, and it's always the case where you know uh, when 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 countries are talking about issues around migration and, and these sorts of things, it's sort of like oh, I don't like migrants, but oh, the Bangladeshis down the street, I love. You know, they you know they they sure. they're, they're a great family sort of thing. Once you get to know people, it, exactly, that, that, all, all of those all of those barriers fall down, and so I think we need to be really careful around. You know, we're talking about misinformation, those sort of things, and the kind of deliberate use of language. Um, to kind of manipulate public understanding of things, you know, we've we, we've we've seen in Australia, you know, we don't have asylum seekers arriving anymore. We have illegals. We don't yeah. have an immigration department. We have a border protection force. All of these sort of semantic changes. You think, mm -hmm. well, it's, they're just words, sort of thing, but they do change people's fundamental understanding of what's happening. And I think um, you 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 need, and that goes to that language is powerful. 
Yeah, absolutely. Words make worlds. And so oh when, you're, when you're, you know, as we were talking about reading critically before, yeah. that's part of it is to understand why are they talking about this in that wow. way? What's What what position is, is this coming from? What point are they trying to make in yeah. using the language that they do? Yeah, when I, I just had an interview with an uh, um, incredible, inspiring woman. Um, she she leads a, a social enterprise, one of the largest in the US that helps um, those that are formerly incarcerated to integrate into society, mm. providing them jobs, and yeah. she talks about you know that that precise issue within um, within the U.S. justice system of there's this there's this kind of language around we've got to be tough on crime and mm. all of these strong emotive language that appeals. What I've always found personally is when I hear politicians on both sides appealing to very whether it be fear dominated language mm. that em- that's a powerful yep. emotion and on the other yep. you know quite often on the on on more left sides you can see you can hear a motivation towards shame like shaming mm. people into you know how could you think differently or have another a pu- view and opinion yep. and against against these are very powerful things well I, I guess i don't want to be seen as a bigot or i don't want to be seen like this so therefore i will not yep will not uh, yeah. you know express my view but what if we were led by compassion you mm. know instead yep. of shame right like instead of and and what if we were led by like courage or or this mm. ideas of you know I've always the things I've done in my life whenever I've taken a risk if it was motivated by compassion and courage uh, those are the those are the times in my life when I've been most proud whenever I've been motivated by fear or shame yeah it it's never <laughs> Never borne any good fruit, really. I, I, yeah. I can, you could look back at a, a number of things. I think I think that's a really interesting point you make. That and and it it takes um, uh, and this is you know uh, to, to 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 your eternal credit, you know, a, a, a great deal of self awareness and and kind of self confidence to be able to interrogate your own motives and say, well, well, why am I doing this? Why do I feel yes. this way? Why am I acting in this way? And to be honest with yourself, to say. It is. I am doing this out of fear. I, you know, I am. Am I voting like because yeah, I'm yeah, afraid, yeah. or am I voting yeah. because I want to create a better? Uh, the, because I'm voting for what I want to create. Mm. You know? Precisely, precisely. And 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 I I think that's a hugely admirable thing, um, and 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 a courageous thing to to be able to sort of look inside yourself and say, well, what are the real motivations here? Um, and I think I think that that goes a long way into understanding your own motivations, but then also the motivations of others with whom you might agree or you might not. Mm. Look, I'd love to hear some of your own the, the the issues that are dear to your heart. You you kind of referenced immigration and and look, you've you're mm. foreign correspondent for almost two decades. I mean, you've been in this gig for a while. You've got a decorated career, mate. I think it's worth noting. <laughs> you know, you don't get to three UN Media Peace Awards and and three Wakeley Walkley Awards. But I'll, those are, I'm sure, th- um, you know peer recognize accolades you're real proud of but i want to know the stories and and the the issues that that birthed Mm. um the incredible work that you've you've done and that has been duly recognized like what what are the issues dear to your heart that um take me back to some of the things that have kind of just along the way just yeah i mean look it's really interesting the the stories that that stay with you. I mean, as a journalist, you you you, you write lots of stories and you and you're interested in 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 in, in lots of things. Um, but the the ones that stay with you aren't you know and and the awards is a thing that kind of you know happens if you live for a very long time like I have. Um, uh, but um, I suppose they're not necessarily the stories that kind of uh, that that live with you and and resonate with you and kind of um uh, and. And sort of fill you up, I suppose, in Australia, you know, in in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a real sense of fulfilment of, you know, I'm I'm making a difference here. Um, mm. So I I when I I was South Asia correspondent based in New Delhi, and I spent about eighteen months on an investigation, um, going up into uh, into the Punjab, into um, places around Jalandhar and, and these sorts of places, um, looking into the sports ball industry and the way it was using child labour in a in an egregious and extreme way that that, that little girls, in particular girls, were being dragged out of school and forced to stitch balls for eight, ten hours a day, you know, with these big heavy needles stitching footballs. And and the, the, the kind of cruel and horrible irony of it was they were making these, you know, girls who were seven and eight and ten years old were making 
sports balls for children on the other side of the world to play with um, and, and the kind of juxtaposition of this child being mm. forced into work so this child can have a game of football and, you know, can, can, can play in their backyard um, was, was you know, intensely painful oh um, to, to, to see and, you know, and, and a kind of a, a, an incredibly stark demonstration of the, the inequality in the world. Um, so it was, a, it was a difficult story. There were sort of legal, you know, dramas, uh, you know, difficulties in trying to tell this story um, and we needed to protect those people who were talking to us from, you know, from recriminations and retribution, those sort of things. The power imbalance in, in telling these stories between these powerful people who controlled these factories and these, mm. these poor families who were, who were um, uh, sort of compelled to work, I suppose, in an almost bonded sense. So it was it was a very complicated story in, in in that way, and difficult for people to talk about because you know this was illegal, um, and 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 this was kind of you know morally hugely uh, problematic as well. So there, it was a really difficult story to tell. But you know, after eighteen months and I think six or seven you know long visits over over numerous days to be able to truly sort of um, uh, live inside this story and understand it properly, we 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 managed to get this story out and it it it, it made 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 a huge impact back in australia um mm. there was you know very high profile brands that that that, uh, that were involved um and were forced to you know um change their practices immediately you know uh, pulling balls off the shelves they they had to wow. sort of restructure the, the the way they they um they they worked in in in, in these countries so that the that families and children in particular weren't exploited but mm. the most valuable thing that, that that came out of it was that the company that was employing children agreed to find the child labourers that it had exploited and that it had used and to put them in school. And it went around and it found wow. upwards of 30 girls oh and it put gosh. them in school and paid for them to go to school. And, and oh my that, gosh. That, 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 that was a minor bit of, of a follow-up story. But I'm always tearing up listening the, to that. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in, in, in the scheme of things, you know, it's not, it's not a, 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 immense, but... To those little girls, it was yeah. like it it, it it changed the direction of, of their lives, and and you know you you and 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 uh, and your listeners will 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 know as well as anyone that you know the, the power of education, particularly having girls Young in schools, girls. and the transformative yes. effect that uh, that has. But just to know that those little girls got an education as a result of that is is hugely rewarding. Um, and just to um, just to uh, to to know, however small that impact is. That it was a massive impact for the for uh, for those little girls who I've kept in touch with over the years, worked with their families through sort sort of intermediaries, and and they're doing well, and, and their lives have taken a different direction. So so those little things, you know, journalism doesn't often make a difference, and journalism comes uh, in for in for criticism a lot of the time, and and often justifiably, you know, yeah. we, we we don't always always get things right, um, but every now and then you can you can make a difference. So something like that is is um you know is is something I'm immensely proud of. Um, there's there's another story about uh, an asylum seeker called Faisal Chagani, who came to Australia from Iran, having suffered brutal persecution, um, and uh, who died on, on Christmas Island, having mm. been through, having been held with the Australia system for four years, having been treated abysmally all the way through, um, and um, and suffered enormously, and at so many points along his journey, people within the system were crying out for him to be helped, mm. and the system didn't do anything to help him, and he ultimately died. Um, on Christmas Island, and it was, and it's a story I've returned to um, several times over. And yeah. I suppose, um, you know, to go to the the theme of our discussion today, seeking yeah. a measure of justice for Faisal, I, I can't do anything to yeah. to um, redress the imbalances that 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 he suffered in his life and the the injustices he suffered in his life. But I can I can seek to make it known and seek to hold to account those who are responsible for, for, for his treatment to say this shouldn't happen. This shouldn't happen to anyone. It shouldn't have happened to Faisal and it must not happen to anybody else. And so I feel a, a great sense of um, of connection and, and, and duty in, in, in telling that story as well to, 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 uh, to sort of to, to bear witness to that, I suppose, because that's the way we know about these things. That's the way things improve, I think. Uh, mate, it, it's um – Journalism can make a difference, just like uh, good friends I've had on this podcast that have even used their own businesses to make a difference. It's incredible to see that whatever it is that we've given as a gift um, or we discover as a gift, uh, whether it be the ability to just write and tell a story, 
uh, you've got a business, you've got a uh, passion for sp- yeah. sports, whatever it is. That I, that I was reading about these um, this uh, this gu- these guys in Afghanistan that love skateboarding. Yes, and yes, ha- yes. I, I don't know, know Skaterstan. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you've heard about yep, them. Yep, and, yeah. And it just makes me think that um, the f- <laughs> so often, you know, we don't think that what we have in our hand actually can – make a, mm. such a profound difference um in the lives of other people and um and i i'm yeah i just thank you for dedicating your life um to you know telling these really important stories and and representing and advocating for those um yeah that don't have oh, a voice look, that don't have a voice that, that's look that that's that's Immensely kind of you, and mm. and you know to 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 know that that, that you know my, my sort of work can go out there and, and can occasionally make a small yeah. difference is is um is hugely fulfilling. But like you say, I think so many of us and so many people have that have that capacity, and you may think that the that mm. the the skills or that that you have or the position that you're in is is unremarkable, is unexceptional. But I I think mm-hmm. if we look to our own lives, almost everybody. Can 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 find a way that, that that they contribute to to um to the greater good to the to the to the benefit of others to the to the welfare of, of their communities and and mm. their world. I I think we all have that capacity. Um and um and it is you know uh, I, I suppose it is the most sort of fundamental thing we can do as human beings is to look after other human it beings. It is. You know? uh, we are we are social creatures. Um we are we are family creatures. Um and. There, there is nothing more fundamental, I, I, I'd argue, than, than than reaching a hand out to your to your fellow human. It's funny. It's funny too because so often our our initial reaction, I don't know where where it comes from, our our need to survive tends to to want to like look after ourselves, take care of ourselves, and um, and but when really. Um, when we take care of those around us, it actually we're actually helping ourselves, like mm. without trying to, you know, you know, be too self-serving in the long game. But it, it it's it's the I think it's a fundamental nature of, of like you said, we're social creatures. We are designed to care for one another, and in that process, you know, we enrich our lives. And I think I think too, okay, Australia has a responsibility. We can take care of our own own self in this world uh, i think mm. of covid right now and clamoring for we've got to have our own vaccines to take care of ourselves and we yeah. we can be drawn ourselves into um to just kind of be you know self-preserving right mm. when maybe the answer even to our own needs and to our own self-preservation in the future is to actually give and to serve those around us and I guess I segue yeah. into your your now role. I guess Pacific edi- editor, looking over yep. the whole region of the Pacific um, Pacific world of ours, and 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 how important it is, and the responsibility we have as Australians to care about the issues that are on our mm. doorstep, and to care about and and to recognise how it actually impacts our own life. And so maybe you could yeah speak in that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I. I- I think you're right, and 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 you know to 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 go back to to the point you were making about the sort of uh, the micro and the macro that that instinct to turn inwards mm. uh, on a human level yeah. um, can pretty quickly be seen to be self defeating. You know, as if if you were to kind of cut off all all contact um, uh, and and interaction with other people, you would quickly you know, wither and die. Essentially, we are social mm. beings. We we need other people around to survive. We we need other people. Um, and I think you can apply that to the macro as well. You know, with a with a crisis like 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 COVID nineteen, the instinct and 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 I, I think it's absolutely an, an understandable instinct is for a nation to kind of turn inwards on itself and look after mm. itself, particularly a nation such as Australia that is so well equipped to deal with exactly. something like COVID nineteen. We're a we're an island nation. Um, uh, we have a good public health care system. We're a, we're a wealthy nation. We can afford the vaccines, and we've got mm. a, you know and a, and a relatively small population. All of those sort of things count in our favour and make it easier for us to look after ourselves but i like you think that that is that is a self-defeating and yeah. and um an unhelpful instinct because i think um i think the response to something like this needs to be regional it needs to be global yeah. this is a global pandemic um and mm. you are not safe for it you you are not safe from it while you are surrounded by it um mm. and the countries in our neighborhood to whom we do owe an obligation to yes. whom we 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 do have um, the 
not only the, the wherewithal, but as I say, the obligation to, to assist. Um, uh, Pacific, you know, our Pacific neighbours are some of the most disadvantaged countries on earth. They, they face immense challenges yeah. Um, in dealing with something like uh, COVID-19, they've got, um, uh, you know, populations with, um, uh, you know, significant comorbidities. They've got weak public health systems. They've mm-hmm. got, you know, the the basic tyranny of distance. Their archipelago nations spread out over thousands of kilometres of the Pacific Ocean. Um, how do you get How do you get a Access. vaccine that needs to be stored at, at at you know at minus seventy degrees to a, wow. to an outer lying island of, of the Cook Islands? Yeah, all, all you know, like really sort of nuts and bolts practical things. So a country like Australia, I think, has an obligation there. Um, this is our neighbourhood. They are our family. Um, we do need to be out in in that part of the world, in the Pacific, in Southeast Asia. Um, doing what we can to assist. Um, and and I think that applies then to to other issues. And again, we come back to this idea of, of, of justice and, and, and this yeah. conceptualisation of justice as an act of imagination. Um, the Pacific Islands are some of the most vulnerable in the world to the impacts of climate change. Um, sea level rise in the Western Pacific is, is some of the fastest in the world. Um, and islands are being threatened today in places like Kiribati, um, in places like, uh, you know, uh, in, in Fiji and the Solomon Islands. I mean, this is not, you know, some theoretical future issue. This is something that people are living with now, mm. um, being inundated, um, having, having you know, storm surges wash over your island, mm. um, your crops, your house, all of those sorts of things. This is, this is a reality for, for, um, for people on these islands. But in a kind of sense of justice, the Pacific Islands have done almost nothing to contribute to climate change. They're, they're exactly. you know, in, 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 in terms of carbon output, wow. the, 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 Pacific, the, the Pacific is the smallest region in the world by so far, yet they are feeling the impacts of climate change first and hardest. Mm-hmm. So my question there is where is the justice in that? Where? And, and, and perhaps, you know, a just solution involves high emitting developed industrialised countries like Australia, like the US, Doing what they can for the Pacific, you know, and and whether that's you know adaptation and mitigation, whether that's um where, whether that's relocation plans and those sort of things, mm. when 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 some islands sadly do become unlivable, you know, what happens to people then? I think there is an obligation, you know, the developed industrialized world has caused this problem. Exactly. What are we going to do to help it? Where is where is the justice there? I mean, I I, I think it is um a terrible and 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 cruel injustice that that the countries that have contributed least to global warming mm. are suffering its Impact effects so first much. and hardest yeah well it isn't it's it's almost the same with anything really though the the oppressed the vulnerable the poor in any mm. society whenever there's any form of tragedy are always uh the ones that suffer the most we see when there's economic collapse you know uh, yep. or, or struggles it seems like the rich get bailed out, or, or the rich can weather yeah. the storm and survive and 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 go through. But it's the it's the mum and dad that uh, scrape and ends to meet that that seem to end up, you know, yeah, yeah. hopeless no, you're, you're, and you're, and without anything. You're absolutely right. I I, I think the pressure is always downwards, and mm. I think again, um, you know, to come back to that active imagination. Well, yeah. what well, what what would it be like if? If I wasn't sure if I could stay in my house, or, you know, mm. to 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 uh, to afford my rent, if I didn't have money to put food on the table, um, what would what was it like if if the ancestral lands that my family's owned for as many generations as I can count are suddenly no longer livable, are suddenly underwater? You know, uh, to 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 imagine another situation, to imagine an, uh, uh, another person's circumstance is a significant first step into into finding a just solution, I think. And I, I always say this to those that um, have endured, um, inc- you know, incredible oppression or or just gone through great tragedy and trauma, many families that I've walked alongside um, mm. and throughout my life. And what I've found, though, is that they have so much to teach us and so much to teach us about resiliency, about... The, the ability for even them to to be grateful and to push on and to move I, I feel like so often um, I don't I don't think we we un, I think we underestimate the incredible gift we have right in front of us um, that have come across the shores that have that are in our neighborhoods in our communities mm. And they too hold the key as well. So it's 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 almost like it's not just uh, this obligation, or 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 
or guilt sometimes that can drive the change. Mm. But it's like that creative imagination of, well, if you if they can overcome what they've overcome, maybe maybe you could put yourselves in their situation, learn a little something from them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's again being led and pushed on, maybe by gratitude instead of guilt, in in a certain de- to a certain degree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I find yeah. Do do you, do you think that the experiences that that you've been through, you know, living with um, you know Yazidi families in in northern Iraq and and um, and the oppression that they face. I mean, to see their resilience has that God. helped you in your life? Do, do you think to be able to say, you know, what I can get through this? This 100%. is a setback, but I can get through this. A hundred percent. And and you, you, what as someone who who's kind of, um, you know, holds on dearly to my Christian faith, uh, my favorite verse is that to God is with the brokenhearted. And I think it was Bono who said to, uh, I think, a prayer breakfast in America, he says, he, he he addresses the crowd, he says, he's in the slums, he's in the streets, he's in, this is where he he is. And mm. and there's this sense of um, um, uh, beauty, beauty, um, uh, even in the midst of the great pain and the sorrow um, that is found in that presence, it 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 it, it breaks through your own soul, and I, it's taken me to places of of you know um, obviously tremendous heartache and and pain, and and sometimes it's hard to kind of move on from some like you sharing your story. I'm almost feeling the tears of of what that would have been like mm. to to walk in the shoes of. Uh, and be amongst these girls and to see their their place it can't do anything but change you and i feel like there's this there is this supernatural moment this experience that happens in that mm. place of of i think great pain and suffering um and but it i think it must and always should lead us to this it, this it cannot this cannot be the way it, it must end you know there there's got to yeah. be something yeah. that that draws you on but yeah yeah no that that's that's a really astri- in, in point in, in that kind of right in that in that that moment of crisis there's a there there is a there is a calm and a um uh and a yeah a, a, a resilience that, that you know an extraordinary resilience that that people can find to to pull themselves through that to to you know to draw themselves forward yeah we 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 uh, one of the key programs we've delivered not only um in in uh, iraq but here in australia is a post-traumatic growth program which really uh, kind of spends time um you know in a very group format walking through maybe some some uh, you know obviously they've gone through incredible trauma they've gone through suffering they've displacement loss grief before ptsd or before some of the more systemic long-term problems gets get kind of sealed into to, to someone's life when they go through something, there's an opportunity mm. in that crisis, you know, to potentially actually use what you're going through to make you stronger, more resilient and, and, and better. And what are some of those key characteristics that um, you can foster? Are there, key, are there key things you can teach somebody in that moment or in, through that mm. process? And they, they've, you know, discovered, you know, these principles of gratitude, of kindness, of this – and I think you've summed it up well in this this phrase of this act of imagination, you know, of of being able to shift your perspective and to something, you know, um, and again, you know, you can't you can't um, can't fast track that, you know, grief and pain and trauma it takes mm. is to- is is something that that just you know um, has its own time you know, um, mm. that it needs to be processed. But uh, I think being surrounded and in an environment where where you're you're able to to look forward um, and um, in those moments um, and rebuild is is yeah, can be you know, really, really critical for people that go yep. through that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd love to just get get behind the scenes of like your actual um, you know your 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 skill of crafting a story. I mean, 
uh, I know some people that that are prolific writers and they sit down and they write a thousand words a day and then they finally, you know, like they only, you know, they do that because at the end of the day they might only have a few words that, that are good but they, you know, they, they just prolif- proliferate and, and, and write and write yeah. and write. But for you, you've often got quite a, a quick time frame to push stories through or there's just mm. maybe you're, you're working on a really long story. What What is it that, you know, that you employ? What's your kind of secret source let's say <laughs> I, I i i wish i knew what it was um I, I i mean i i suppose yeah i mean as i say journalism you know that that sort of rough draft or first draft of history like it often is um very quickly written um and uh you know uh, news stories need to be turned around quite quickly i i i do think there there, there is a difference there, there there are some news stories that are kind of uh for the moment and um and you write them and um you know your writing there is 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 very functional um and it's just about the kind of sort of you know as seamless as possible transmission of information from mm-hmm. you know from from my fingers to uh, you know uh, from um uh in into the minds of 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 whoever's reading um i think there is a different process for those sort of longer more in-depth pieces where mm-hmm. you really need to um you need a lot of time and you need a lot of headspace to kind of get into a story and i mean i when I'm when I'm writing a piece like that, I will sort of seal myself off a bit. You know, phone goes off or on the silent, um, and I, I, you know, email notifications, everything else yeah. goes off, and it's just kind of you've you've kind of got to live in that story, um, and that's very much the only way I I find I can write. Um, and sometimes um, finding the voice or the essence of what I want to bring out can 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 take a little time, um, and. Um, there can be, you know, several false starts and, you know, and I, I remember, you know, writing some, uh, some pieces, um, that have gone through, you know, 16, 17, 18 drafts before I kind mm. of get them right. Whereas some new stories you bang, you write top to bottom. Yeah. Perfect. Out it goes. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that, that's an important f- functional news, uh, news tool, but, but there are other stories that you kind of live with and that are, you know, that are, are kind of creations that you want to be really proud of that you want every mm. word right that you you go through again for the 40th time just to go is that comma in exactly the right spot is, mm. is that is that uh, am i am i reflecting exactly mm. what i'm trying to convey here so um so those pieces you know you you live with um quite intensely while while they're with you and then and you feel very kind of proprietal almost kind of paternal about them and then you have to send them out into the world for other people to to read and to criticize and to mm. like or to not like and those sort of things. And, 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 um, and it's hugely rewarding it when something that you feel is important and, a, you know, a, a story that, 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 that you felt is um, vital to get out into the world sort of lands on, 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 on fertile ground, you know, yeah. and, and you see people respond, people call you Sharing. up, people write you letters, people send you emails or, or on Twitter or, 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 or whatever, or, or, you know, we, we get letters to the guardian or something, you know, that, that, that you see that um, it's resonating with people. And that yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's kind of, you know, going to agree with you, but that, that you've made a kind of valued contribution that, that, um, that people have taken the time to read and, and, and consider. So, um, I can yeah, imagine it's almost a, there, like that. There's a, there's a sense of letting go and, and a sort of sense yeah. of powerlessness once you send it out into the world that it's not it's not yours anymore. It belongs to everybody else, and that 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 can be um that can be full on. I can imagine there's that there's that some sometimes there's that essence to a piece or uh, that you don't even know what it is that somehow it's like a song that suddenly hits the charts and they've you know someone's mm. they've perform- yeah. they've written a, a thousand songs before that they like better, but somehow this one. Yeah, there was something yeah. about it, and and that's yeah. the beauty I think of of that human element to it. Mm. It's 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 there's yeah there's something very yeah yeah and 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 something slightly um, charming in the unpredictability of it. You know you sure. never quite know how things are land um, and and what's going to resonate with people. Um, yeah, and that's that's all. It's all be, part uh, of it. And, be a lure. and mm. you've 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 taken your pen to writing. Uh, a book as well. Um, can you talk a little about that? Is that all right? Can we? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. No, I, I, I love talking about Nagaland, and that's kind of um, 
almost kind of, yeah. I mean, look, I, I love talking about it because it takes me back to this place. Um, yeah. Nagaland, which is behind me there. Yep. There it is. Um, uh, I, I wrote a novel and I never thought I'd write a novel. I never had ambitions to be a novelist. I, um, uh, but, um, uh, but this was a story that called me. Um, mm. uh, I, and, and, and forced itself upon me and sort of knocked at the front of my skull saying, you haven't told me yet. You haven't told me yet. So, um, it, it, it gives me, um, immense, um, uh, joy to know that it's out in the world and, and, and mm. people can read it. The, the, the book is called Nagaland. Um, and Nagaland is a tiny, almost forgotten state of India. India is, this is mm. very difficult to do on a podcast. India is sort of <laughs> diamond shaped roughly, you know, Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Chennai, Calcutta, but it also goes up and over the other side of Bangladesh. And there are seven states there, seven small mountainous states. Mm. I sort of call them the seven sisters. And the sort of furthest and most remote and smallest one is called Nagaland. And it's the home of the Naga people wow. who are a, um, a, a, a um, ethnically much more closely related to uh, the Tibetans and, um, uh, and, and, and the Burmese. Um, and I've always felt a very strong sense of disconnection from, um, from India. So I, I stumbled into this story in a very sort of strange way, I used to play in a rock band in Delhi. I played in a in a, uh, a rock and roll band called the Chum Chum, and um, oh we, we 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 turned up we turned up for a gig one night, and you know, like people would come and watch us play, but not that many. And this place was full; it was heaving, and it was full of Naga people. Um, and the band who were playing before us were called the Featherheads. And my first sight of Augustine, who was the protagonist of this book, was Augustine stripped to the waist, you know, uh, shirtless with long hair, but shaved at the sides, and the and a feather from a hornbill bird stuck out the back of his um, head and he was singing in Nagamese, um, uh, their, their sort of shared language um, between the various Naga, Naga tribes. It's their, it's their um, uh, communal language. And um, this incredibly powerful um, uh, song and just this sort of this captivating man to look at, like absolutely extraordinary. He was also decorated in the sort of tattoos of, of the Naga people, including the facial tattoos of, of the ancient headhunters. Um, and so this sort of compelling matter and, and, um, um, and uh, the Featherheads was a support band for us, and it should have been the other way around because they were much better than us, and they had many more, you know, fans Followers. than we did. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, yeah, anyway, um, we, we we had this extraordinary gig, and then afterwards, I was I was talking to to, to Augustine, and, and I asked him about Nagaland, and I, you know, I was a correspondent in that part of the world, and I was aware of Nagaland, but knew nothing about it. And he started to tell the stories of his childhood and his people. It was just utterly compelling. He said, "You'll have to come one day," and I sort of thought it was this sort of throwaway line, but. From then on, Augustine and I would see each other around the place, and, and we fell into this this curious friendship where he would just appear in my life and then disappear again. And he, he appeared one day when I had dengue fever and was sort of writhing on the floor mm. in pain with this strange concoction in a Coke bottle. Um, this was strange green bubbling liquid that he forced me to drink. I don't know if it helped you know, or not. <laughs> yeah, helped helped or hindered, but I'm here telling you the story. So anyway, and 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 eventually he said, "No, you really must come to Nagaland." And so I went up there and I found this. Um, extraordinary um, community up there, he, he, these uh, communities. He, he was from a, a place called Akrul, which is technically in Manipur, but is part of the sort mm. of um, the broader Naga community. Um, and um, I met with his family and I stayed with his family and we would go to his village and we would sit and in the morning we'd wake up and say, which direction are we going to walk? And we would walk along the ridges of these hills. Like These are the foothills of the Himalayas. They lead up to Mount Everest. They're very high mountains. And we would walk from village to village and we would sit down and we would share stories and we'd share food. And I was drawn into this extraordinary world of, of, of the Naga people about which I knew nothing. And I had no intention of writing a story or anything. It was just mm. a sort of um, very profound and spectacular place. Wow. Um, and I left... Um, I left Nagaland. Oh, I, I left India and came back to Australia just before the birth of my first child. And about a year after that, a package arrived. This sort of battered um, mm -hmm. uh, yellow um, envelope, um, and it was postmarked Nagaland. And I opened it up, and it was Augustine's diary. This leather-bound diary that he would carry everywhere he went, and was filled with song lyrics and maps and drawings of hornbills. A hornbill is a very sacred bird to the Naga people, and and it was this intensely personal and intensely important. Um, book that he had everywhere and in a moment of personal crisis he needed to keep that book safe and he sent it to the, the first place he could think of where it would be safe and that was to me in australia um oh my and from there this story un un unspooled so the, the novel is an interesting novel in that well i say it's interesting um in that it, it lives in the 
in their hinterland between Augustine's life experience and the struggles of the Naga people. There's been an insurgency for independence for, since since the independence of India. Uh, for, for 60 years, the, the uh, Naga people have been ravaged by um, a heroin epidemic and an HIV mm-hmm. epidemic, which followed um, through you know dislocation and interrupted schooling and, and uh, economic disadvantage and oppression. Um, uh, you know, significant violence from the military, but also Augustine's role as the keeper of his people's stories and and wow. and the, the 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 book lives in the hinterland between um uh augustine's life story the history of the naga people and the myths and legends of those people mm. um and it's all told through um the diary and um and wow. and augustine's um augustine's moment of crisis i suppose and it's also a love story so i've, I've oh crammed, my a, I've crammed a fair bit in. so but it but it's it was it was as i say a story i never thought i would write i never um, envisaged myself writing, but once the diary came to me, there was this obligation, this yeah. compulsion. And I even tried to put it away a few times. I'd write drafts and then stick it in a drawer and say, really? I can't do it. It's too difficult. I can't write this story. Wow. Um, but it would keep coming back to me and said, you haven't told me yet. And so uh, eventually I realized that I had to tell this story and, and that story is Nargalan. And it's really nice to talk about. And I know I've, I've, I've sort of rambled on a bit, but I wish we talked every, more about every, this. Every, <laughs> this every, phenomenal. every Every everybody I talk to about Nagaland or everybody who reads Nagaland, you know, Augustine's story lives on in another person. There's another person who knows about the Naga, who knows about Augustine's story. Um, and that feels to me like that's that's been my purpose with this is 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 to keep his story and 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 the story of the Naga, you know, a, 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 a alive a little mm. more. So um, I'm always happy to talk about Nagaland. Oh man, that's phenomenal. It, and it it feels quite fitting to kind of wrap things up just kind of talking about a story um you know the the theme of really what i want the podcast to really emphasize is a a world where everyone belongs even the naga you know naga people Mm. and and we don't know until we hear and uh thank you you know thanks for kind of taking augustine's story his people um and 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 sharing it and carrying it along yeah and and you've done that um i think in 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 a lot of your work and um it's yeah again i i've really been looking forward to to spending um having this conversation with you spend this time catching up again it's been a while last you know you can sum you can if you could sum this up in a couple of sentences what what is it that gives you hope i know when when you answered the question of 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 why does justice matter as we were kind of prepping for this um you 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 talked about this world being more and more fractured and yet justice is about bringing things together what in 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 the back frame of when you of seeing a, a you know this world and the hopelessness that there seems to be in how divided and how in unequal it, it it has become what drives you on what inspires you is there somebody that inspires you is what is it that gives you hope for the future because i think that holds mm. the key for us to to, to yeah. keep going i i think you're right um i mean i there are certain people that inspire me in in, in different ways and in, in 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 different situations but i think um i think you know <laughs> I think humanity sort of resilience and kind of fundamental optimism is the thing that drives me. I mean, you know, um, and I think um, because there's always tomorrow, because tomorrow is yet to be dictated, because tomorrow has potential to be better mm. than today. That's what sort of yes. that's what sort of drives us on. And I'm I'm consistently, as you know, as 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 you were re- reflecting earlier in your experiences with the Yazidi, even in these times of immense crisis. And I I I, I don't think that that too many people would would contest that the world is going through a very difficult mm. time at the moment. We are facing significant crises on 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 a number of fronts. That that there is um, there is a calm and a resilience that exists there and an almost spiritual stillness mm, that you can say, yeah. we can make tomorrow better than today and we can take small steps to make things better. I, I, I think there is a fundamental underlying resilience in humanity and, and yes. an underlying um, uh, optimism. And I think um, that's what that's what drives us all through. Yeah. Well said, mate. Thanks again. Mate, Tim, it's been an absolute pleasure. I could honestly talk all day. It's been absolutely... Um, oh, I've, me I've too. Absolutely, 
but uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it and um, and let's not make it so long before we catch up again soon but that, that'll be fantastic